Shannon? Um, welcome, I'm here, <laughs> to the global seminar of the Global Columbia Collaboratory. I'm Shannon Marquez, Dean for Undergraduate Global Engagement at Columbia University, and I'm so excited that you've joined us today for a conversation about the future of work. Now, since most of us have experienced over a year of remote work and a shift in our work-life balance as a result of the pandemic, it is indeed an honor to have a panel of distinguished experts here with us stepping into the Global Columbia Collaboratory to draw on insights from psychology, economics, human resource management, and practical experience for a robust discussion about this important topic. And now before we begin, and especially for those of you joining for the first time today, I want to provide a bit of background about the Global Columbia Collaboratory. With the disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, the Columbia University Center for Undergraduate Global Engagement, in partnership with Columbia Global Centers and the Columbia World Projects, launched the Global Columbia Collaboratory as a virtual exchange initiative to support students around the world. The Collaboratory brings students, thought leaders, and educators together, promotes cross-cultural communication, and enhances skills and global competence to allow students to reflect, ideate, and collaborate to empower them to make a difference in the world. Students have participated from over 25 different countries and are drawn from all three undergraduate schools at Columbia, representing over 30 majors. And we also have students participate from dual degree programs with Sciences Po in Paris and Trinity College Dublin. Using smartphones and laptops to access the collaboratory virtual exchange platform, Students form a community of global thinkers and problem solvers through participation in theme global seminars featuring international speakers, such as our seminar today, as well as facilitated reflection, ideation, and collaboration activities. As learnings and perspectives are shared across the collaboratory, students are encouraged to collaborate to support the further development of ideas into projects that have the potential to address the most urgent challenges of our time. Student project teams receive funding to tackle specific global issues and topics of interest, and their work is featured in our online gallery. So we are thrilled that over 300 student participants have been actively engaged in the collaboratory since its launch in May of 2020. And we currently have a summer cohort of collaboratory students joining us live today from around the world. And this is the first seminar of the summer cohort. Welcome to all of you. Now, some of our students will ask questions to our panelists today, and I encourage the global audience to also submit questions to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Again, I wanna welcome everyone to this Global Columbia Collaboratory Seminar, and I wanna thank all of our partners and our esteemed panelists. We are so pleased to be working directly with the Columbia Global Centers for these seminars. And at this time, I want to introduce Safwan Masri, Columbia University Executive Vice President for Global Centers and Global Development, who will introduce us to our panelists today. Safwan? Thank you very much, Shannon. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you joining us today uh, and to our panelists who are uh, beaming in from a number of cities around the world. A few years back, a peer academic institution offered a course that instantly broke all enrollment records and apparently remains the most popular class in that elite school's 320 year history. Psychology and the good life has subsequently been made available in massive online forums, indicating perhaps that vast numbers of students feel they need to learn how to create better lives. This is not necessarily what one might expect from accomplished young people who have matriculated at prestigious universities and seen the embodiment of success. Yet, as we emerge from the pandemic, this realization appears prescient. It is not good enough to prepare only for demanding careers. Fulfillment derives from a balanced life, which we have learned does not happen automatically. So how do we build such lives for ourselves? It may actually require unlearning many of the behaviors that have been rewarded by the very institutions such as our own um, to drive, to, 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 to motivate students to have a drive to excel that encourages constant achievement and compels overwork. 
the pandemic interrupted our acclimatization and it drove to the forefront issues that had previously been somewhat privatized, experienced by individuals, but not addressed collectively. Now, with large percentages of the workforce unemployed, many from the same sectors that disproportionately suffered health consequences, and even more people experiencing anxiety, burnout, and toxic levels of stress, there is an opportunity perhaps to rethink both the structures and strictures of work. Western attitudes towards life being separated into work and leisure can be attributed to Aristotle, who thought that we did the former in order to be able to have the latter. And of course, the notion that a person's worth was determined by how hard he or she worked is a legacy of the Protestant Reformation. When technological advances ushering in the Industrial Revolution produced a culture of chronic overwork, the response was legislative regulations about child labor, the invention of the weekend, and the eight hour workday. What are the solutions today when technology has erased any boundary between home and office or school? The convenience of being able to zoom in or answer emails while making their dinner or not having to cope with commuter issues has to be balanced with the fact that work becomes omnipresent in our lives. There is abundant personal advice on how to manage. Go exterior, get up and away from the phone or the computer, Go for a walk, notice the world, or the opposite, go interior, disconnect from everything, and meditate. Some are suggesting a different kind of withdrawal from the corporate world entirely and into more creative pursuits, less remunerative, but with greater control or more non-financial rewards. All of these scenarios underscore a fundamental reality. What we do for work defines us and largely shapes our identity. If that is true, then how do we achieve balance in our lives? Perhaps what we want is not balance, but integration, a whole life in which one part of our life is not threatening to outweigh another. The pandemic made people's family obligations and connections more visible, and thus hopefully more acceptable. This seems worth capitalizing on, Potential recruits can begin interrogating the internal culture of corporations, asking questions that encourage the company to continue developing flexible and accommodating structures that value the whole person and not only their productivity. The biggest lesson of the pandemic may be that flexibility and the ability to shift in order to accommodate a constantly changing reality is essential for a culture to survive. Can we make this an essential value of corporate culture? To help us answer these questions and many others, we have with us four extraordinary scholars and practitioners. I will introduce each one at a time with a question addressed to them. After the panelists have each answered the first question, we will pivot to a more informal interactive conversation and then Q&A from our collaborative students and our global audience which Shannon Marquez will moderate. I will begin with Dr. Cindy Pace. Dr. Pace is Vice President, Global Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at MetLife. She is an adjunct professor of organizational leadership at Columbia School of Professional Studies, where she teaches courses on inclusive leadership and leading cross-cultural global organizations. Cindy is also a guest lecturer in the Women's Leadership Network Program at Columbia's Global Center in Rio de Janeiro. Prior to MetLife, Cindy worked for Pfizer in various corporate management and global leadership roles, including in clinical research, diversity, and executive leadership development. As a leadership scholar practitioner, Dr. Pace's research and practice Center on Advancing Diverse Women and Professionals in Business Leadership. Dr. Pace received her master's degree from New York University and her PhD from Teachers College at Columbia University. Welcome, Cindy. It's really great to have you with us. I'd like to start by asking for your thoughts on what's being referred to as the burnout crisis. Do you think burnout is experienced differently among culturally diverse populations 
by race, gender, or ethnicity within the United States and perhaps more globally. And if you can comment, Cindy, on this burnout syndrome and how it has been perhaps exacerbated um, during the pandemic, because it certainly did exist before the pandemic. So over to you, Cindy. Uh, need to un unmute, Cindy, please. No, still can't hear you. Okay, um, Cindy seems to be having audio issues. So I'm gonna reserve that question, Cindy, if you don't mind, and come back to you. Uh, hopefully you will resolve that soon. So let me turn to um, second panelist, Dr. Iwana Lupu. Dr. Lupu is a professor at the ESSEC Business School in France. Oh, I see Cindy, your audio is good. So um, Iwana, I have started introducing you. I'll come back to you in a few minutes, okay? Um, so, Cindy, let's hear okay. from Okay, you. you can hear me now. We can hear you loud and awesome. clear. Awesome, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, and it's just great to be part of today's collaboratory and I look forward to the discussion. But to the question um, that you asked, and I think the way that you opened you just really pointed to a lot of critical things for us to consider in terms of the burnout crisis. We are experiencing, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, a global mental health crisis. I think it's been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, but according to the American Psychological Association, they've been monitoring stress uh, for a number of years. And this is now known as, as you mentioned, the burnout crisis. And I do believe there is a difference across race, ethnicity, gender, culture. Um, the 24 hour always on extreme work culture that we have experienced within this past year has actually brought the invisible into the visible, especially with our lives. What was once maybe behind the curtain, you didn't really see everything about us, became front and center, as you mentioned, uh, with Zoom. And I think this is stressful in a number of ways. When you think about our differences, there's a huge role that socioeconomics plays in that. And so to what degree can you cover your background, right? So you know, people are looking into your homes. They may be making decisions about um, who you are, what you do, the things that are on your wall, the things that we choose to pull and view. There was a lot of stress of actually having to present ourselves in a certain way to continue to come across professional. And I think we still don't know to what extent the effects, this has affected our well being. Uh, perhaps our, even our happiness, and arguably our performance for women and people of color and people from different cultural backgrounds. There, there has existing always been a question of trust, um, authenticity, and what level of vulnerability can you operate across? What's the spectrum? And I think now, as we go into this whatever we're calling it, the future of work, where we have these hybrid models or certain people will be able to work from home. People are questioning, is this going to have an impact on my career? And I think that constant concern brings across a lot of anxiety and stress in terms of, um, do I actually have a choice? So I know we'll talk more, but one of the things I wanna say in closing here is this is why the role of equity becomes so important because for people to operate at their best, we need to understand what those conditions are, especially through the dimensions of diversity and the role of equity is going to be paramount because people need to have what they need to thrive and be successful. So corporates, um, academic institutions, we really have to look for work models that provide a sense of choice and control.
for our employees and also for our students, um, which is more germane for today. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. And I want to come back to the issue of equity because I think that's really, really important. And um, you know, we can talk about sort of how do we ensure that we have um, a just and equitable work environment. Um, so now um, back uh, to you, um, Iwana, Dr. Iwana Lupu, uh, who's a professor at the ESSEC Business School in France. Uh, prior to joining ESSEC, Dr. Lupu was a lecturer in management control at Queen Mary University in London. And she was a Marie Curie Senior Research Fellow at Cass Business School Center for the Study of Professional Service Firms. She's the author of Carrière de Femme, Identité, Socialisation et Vie Familiale dans les cabinets d'outils et d'expertise. Uh, basically speaking about women's careers, their identity, socialization, and the family in the audit um, and, and uh, management control uh, uh, sector of the economy. Dr. Lupu received her PhD in management control from the Conservatoire National des Arts et Métiers and her Master's of Science in Decision and Management Control from the Academy of Economic Studies in Bucharest. Um, Iwana, the pandemic brought work-life balance issues front and center to every workforce sector and to every level of work, from entry level to senior executives. What's the responsibility of institutions? So building off what Cindy has shared with us about the importance of addressing the burnout challenge. Uh, the question to you is, where do institutions fit into this? What is their role? Um, what is their responsibility to workers in terms of preventing burnout? Uh, is this a moral and a productivity imperative? Um, you know, what's good for workers is good for the bottom line, um, is oftentimes um, a mantra that is used. And if that is true, how can institutions and workers make sure this is part of the culture and that workers take advantage of what is offered? Hi, everybody, and thank you, Safwan, for this invitation and uh, for, for this question. Um, I, I have been studying knowledge workers, um, such as auditors, consultants, lawyers, for the last 10 years or so. And this is a population that I know well, and thus my answers will focus uh, on my research findings uh, related to this population. Um, so this is admittedly a um, relatively privileged population because of generally having the resources to deal uh, with uh, housework and childcare, for instance. However, um, there is recent surveys and recent research show that this population uh, reported increased levels of stress and burnout, uh, and particularly uh, women, especially women in um, senior roles, were shown uh, to be um, significantly more impacted by this uh, always-on culture uh, with the um, uh, reports, for instance, uh, uh, showing that senior women, uh, women are um, uh, 1.5 times more likely than senior men to think about downshifting uh, their role or leaving the workforce um, because of COVID-19. Almost three in four cite burnout as a main reason for this. So, so we see that uh, this current crisis uh, has had the, um, uh, a significant impact on, on this population. And work-life balance, I think it is a, co a complex issue which requires a complex multi-level response, uh, especially, in, I think, in this time of crisis. And it is undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly uh, a moral and the productivity or business case, as, as companies often put it, uh, uh, imperative. Uh, and the companies start, uh, I think, increasingly to recognize and accept both uh, of, this, uh, of these sides. Whereas years ago, when I started my research, um, many companies were uh, advancing uh, this business case. So, so yes, we want to promote uh, um, women or we want to promote uh, work-life balance because uh, that's, uh, a pos that's positive for the bottom line. 
I think that now increasingly I see uh, companies taking up this moral case. So we want to promote well-being because it is the right uh, thing to do. And us uh, as employers have a responsibility towards uh, the organ our, our employees. Uh, and uh, the need, uh, so they recognize the need to create a culture which is nurturing and empowering, uh, which allows uh, for flexible, uh, flexible work arrangements. Um, and, and I also, all, all, also see how um, companies have been uh, uh, struggling uh, to get away from this uh, pervasive culture of uh, presenteeism. Uh, now, um, culture, uh, and it's been recognized in, in, in research, it's something that is very difficult to, to, to change. It's very difficult. Um, it's something that, you know, it takes years to create, and then it's, it's very difficult uh, uh, to alter. Uh, but I think, you know, what there is something that it's, I think it's important to understand. Uh, and, and I, in my research, I, this is something that I, um, uh, that I, 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 you know, I try to make clear, uh, it, it's that, um, it's, culture is something that it, it is alive. It's created, uh, by individuals and, and then, uh, it, it, it shapes also in, and the influences individuals uh, in actions. And one thing that I found that it works quite well uh, as an approach um, to, to, to change culture, uh, it's, it's uh, to, um, to construct a management, uh, um, an organizational uh, control system uh, which um, aligns employees' behaviors with organizational objectives. Because uh, if organiza an organizational uh, espouses really the, these objectives of promoting work-life balance, then um, uh, what, I mean, the best way to, um, to make sure that uh, this is really um, uh, that we see uh, this really, um, um, that there is, this is something that uh, appears, you know, uh, it's re, um, in, in um, daily practices. It, it is to uh, align um, um, practices, uh, as I was saying, control practices such as recruitment, uh, performance evaluation, evaluation, socialization, um, remuneration with these objectives. So have uh, really uh, key performance indicators that, that uh, monitor the progress of uh, managers towards these objectives. It's only when this is integrated in the management control, such KPIs are integrated in the management control system that we can see change coming, uh, uh, coming about. Otherwise, uh, if we continue, um, um, if we, otherwise it's, it's really what we measure is what we get. I mean, if you measure people uh, by bringing in a uh, new business or by working, um, uh, those, which if you um, reward the people who work um, very long hours, then this is the courage, uh, this is what you encourage as, a, as an organization. So, so it is uh, really important from my point of view to, um, to align a strategy and with the, uh, the organizational control practices in order to uh, see change. So fascinating. Okay, so, so you're tying in the, the metrics that are used to measure productivity with the uh, policies, if you will, that the institution puts in place. Um, but, you know, any institution can claim, right, that it does that. Um, and so your work is really focused on um, the, the way to measure whether it actually does that or not, if I understand it correctly. Um, but let me just follow up with a question, um, which is, the question sometimes is whether the institution and individual work environments support employees actually taking advantage 
of what the institution is offering in terms of work-life balance. Um, you know, in other words, what's the point of having the benefits uh, for the employees, which are related to productivity, which is important for the institution, uh, you know, what's the point of that if the employees don't actually use them? So do you look at that part of the dynamic, um, Iwana? Do you look at sort of, you know, what the individuals do or do not do to take advantage? Yes, yes, that's right. And, uh, and of course, the acceptability of, uh, uh, of taking uh, this um, flexible work arrangement, this is something that is important. And I could see in my own research how, for instance, uh, fathers uh, were telling me that, uh, you know, uh, they feel that it is not acceptable for them to work part time. Uh, whereas for uh, for mothers it is so 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 of course yes uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, this also comes down to to the to the acceptability uh, of uh, of these work arrangements and we know very well and you know employees know it very well that often those who uh, take uh, uh, up uh, these uh, flexible uh, work arrangements they are penalized their their careers are penalized because they are considered uh, to not be sufficiently committed so so people who uh, really want to promote uh, their careers uh, find it difficult uh, to do that. And especially if they are, uh, you know, the only ones maybe in their teams or uh, between, uh, you know, representing a minority in their organizations. I mean, the big change that we saw now with the, with the current crisis is that, you know, massively, I mean, people were pushed uh, to to uh, adopt these flexible flexible work arrangements and to work from home, so it all it all of the sudden became acceptable because everybody was doing it. So so these kind these people who resorted to work arrangements, they weren't singled out. Yes, it's that woman who works part time in that department, or uh, right. you know. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana. Christian, it's nice to see you. Uh, Christian Vanizet uh, is an Obama scholar, co-founder of makesense.org, uh, which is a global network of 100,000 citizens and entrepreneurs committed to solving social and environmental issues. Make Sense citizens support 3,200 local initiatives tackling the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in 100 cities and 45 countries around the world. Christian served, received his bachelor's and master's degrees in business innovation from the Kedge Business School in France. And in 2016, he was named one of Forbes' top 30 social entrepreneurs under 30 in Europe. He is also a member of the French government's Digital Council and an advisory board member of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's Goalkeeper Initiative. Christian, I think you also join us from Paris, where Iwana is. Um, so um, nice to see you. Can you speak to the younger generation, since you are one of the uh, top 30, under 30, according to Forbes, Forbes Social Entrepreneurs, um, what are the younger generation's expectations of career and work-life balance and how that is similar to or different from what older generations expected? And, you know, some of our students might also be wondering how the pandemic might have impacted in the long run those who graduated into a pandemic workforce without first having had the chance to experience a normal work environment. So over to you, Christian. Yes. Hello, everyone. It's nice to see you, Safwan, and to be again with the Columbia University community. Um, so uh, I'm Christian. I come from Tahiti, French Polynesia. It's a really small uh, island in the middle of the Pacific, but right now I'm in France. And I don't know if I can see the whole of the, the young generations because it's becoming really diverse so from 18 to 35 with uh, but uh, what I've seen uh, on the platform that we have with Make Sense, where we have 100,000 citizens uh, using our programs uh, every week across the world, is 
And, and the conferences I've been doing in some universities, I try to do one conference per week during the, the different lockdowns to really take the pulse of the student, is that whether you have diplomas, uh, good degrees or not, uh, there's a lot of stress and anxiety about the future. First, it was the stress and anxiety from young generation about, uh, I'm, I don't see my, uh, my colleagues, I don't go to classes anymore, everything is on Zoom, so there's kind of losing the social link, I can't party. But now there's the anxiety of what is going to be the economic crisis like? Will I be able to get a job? Uh, will I be able to network to be able to get a job if I still have to get on Zoom and if there's variants and then we can't go back to life as normal? So there's a lot of stress and anxiety I could feel, especially from students who were about to graduate. And we've seen that a lot in our programs. A lot of them are, are doing volunteering so that they can meet with people and, and try to, but it's, it's kind of uh, really a, uh, strong and it doesn't matter if you have diplomas or not. And then the second big change uh, I'm seeing is that there's a lot of uh, the younger generation who has degrees and diploma of good universities like Columbia, for example, or ESSEC in France, uh, are asking themselves more and more, uh, what is, uh, why are they working? Is it only to have their paycheck to develop their career? Uh, but what is the meaning and the purpose behind their job? And it's especially strong in the engineer uh, sector, especially in France, when you talk about the climate crisis and people are telling us that we have 10 years to fix it, uh, like there's been a movement of engineers in engineer saying, okay, we're in the oil industry, for example, otherwise we sabotage our own future. And so this question of purpose at work are becoming really important. And during the pandemic, the, the web page that had the most visit was a web page called jobs.makesense.org, where people can go for, look for jobs to do social or environmental goods. And we never had that growth of visitors. It's 50,000 unique visitors per week trying to look for job opportunities to have a career that also make an impact. Uh, and so we've been approached by Le Monde newspaper to do a series of articles about this new generation of people with good degrees looking for more purpose in their career. So I think there's something happening that, that's uh, at the same time uh, uh, inspiring because it also makes corporates have to change if they want to attract those talents in the companies. And so the thing, this is really good news uh, on social and romantical issues. And then the third thing I'm seeing is that um, uh, there's a call to reinvent how organization and management works. And it's a bit like what Cindy was saying, how do you create work models where people have more choice and control? And so this goes with like more agile teams, maybe new forms of governance, less hierarchy. There's a lot of really innovative work happening. And I can feel like the young generation is really uh, willing to work differently in teams to collaborate, to feel that you're part of a collective that doesn't just care about your KPIs, but also cares about how you're doing uh, because mental health have been compli complicated this last year. And so a bit like more people friendly culture. And even if companies see it as not really augmenting productivity in the short term, I think it augments the resilience of organization when there's a crisis and people still need to be motivated while working at work. So this was the three kind of weak signals I can see from our practice with the nonprofit I started. Uh, with many of the thoughts you discussed. Very, very, very um, interesting, Christian. Thank you so much. Uh, so now we turn finally to Abby, Abby Weiss Carver, um, is Global Head of Design for WeWork. Uh, before joining WeWork in 2015, Abby worked at Diller, Scofidio, and Renfro in New York on diverse architectural projects such as the Columbia University Medical School, the Columbia Business School, which is going up in Manhattanville and will open in uh, uh, the spring of next year, uh, the Wishart Pavilion in Indianapolis, and the Washington Monument Grounds Competition at the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Abby holds a Master of Architecture from the University of Pennsylvania. I, of course, am very proud of the partnership that Columbia Global Centers and WeWork established uh, this past year to provide our international students with study and convening spaces in 90 cities around the world when the pandemic imposed travel and in-person class restrictions. So I expect 
so that some of the students joining us today are joining us from WeWork facilities, Abby, um, and in a number of cities. Uh, Abby, you come to us with a unique experience in design. And so my question to you is, what are the current demands and trends um, in terms of what workers and their bosses want from space and a physical work environment? Uh, thank you, Safwan, and thank you, everybody. Um, I mean, I think one thing to note is we're sort of in this once in a lifetime opportunity when we think about work. I mean, I think like activity-based workplace, um, remote work, flexible work has been discussed um, frequently over time, but it's like this one moment of COVID has actually forced us to address that. Um, and I think it's clear that there's no one, one size fits all um, for companies and for work. Um, and I think what we're seeing is just as like a very primary level, like, you know, going, thinking about the Maslow diagram about the five tier model of human needs, like safety has to be there, right? And so when we think about safety, we think about physical safety, but I think that also translates into mental safety to ensure people can come into a space, they know it's been clean, they know it's been handled, they know how to get there and they feel like they understand the environment well enough that they can feel that safety. Um, you know, and I think really what we're addressing now is just the fact that, you know, flexibility and hybrid work are the future. Um, you know, we've, we've tapped into some data from Brightspot and Hamilton Place strategies and addressing the fact that like there's a massive decrease in innovation, core collaboration, um, eroding company culture and, and really hindered career growth opportunities, especially for younger workers. Um, so, you know, from WeWork, we're thinking about it kind of from two levels. I think one is, is the portfolio level, you know, and, and thinking about how a company might um, handle their entire real estate portfolio of all their offices globally or even nationally. Um, and, you know, the former model is, you know, how do people go to work? You go to an HQ, you go to the central space, and now, you know, it's really about decentralizing that and thinking about there's actually three places to work potentially or more. You know, you can work from home, you work from a local office, maybe a co-working facility, or you go into that central office and, you know, flex work policies, you know, are gonna become the new normal. Um, and, and, you know, and a great example of that is, is Coinbase who we worked with where they moved away from their San Francisco HQ and now have taken up more, um, you know, satellite offices with us and spreading people around and giving them that flexibility. Um, and then the other is really thinking about the office solution. So once we sort of establish a portfolio strategy, like how are people using the office? I mean, you know, in the past, it's sort of you come in, it's a sea of desks. It's all about focus work. And, and as we think towards the future, you know, how do we create that true activity based workplace that is able to handle trainings? Like, why would you come into the office? You might for a social event or you might need to come in for a special meeting or a collaboration event or potentially you know, a training for, for new employees. So how do you reconfigure furniture, think about prefab rooms, think about quick fixes to space so that, you know, because I think what we're gonna experience is our solutions a year ago and six months ago are no longer our solutions today. And this, this need for and change of physical space and how workplace looks will change over the next year to year and a half. So we wanna make sure that we have really sort of great, um, uh, you know, solutions that, that can be adjusted within a few weeks rather than a few months. Um, and also just thinking about why you would come into to the office. Maybe you come in for a few hours of the day rather than coming in and having that flexibility and confidence from your employer that that's okay. Um, I think the other thing we're seeing, which is, you know, has also been brought up by COVID is, and it's you know existed, but I think it's been brought to the forefront is just inclusivity, um, you know. And I think a lot of companies think about it with benefits, but you know we think about it very much on physical space, like you know a non-binary bathrooms or having you know handicap accessibility or even prayer rooms or mothers' rooms or even wellness spaces to make sure that the physical space meets the needs of everybody, so that when you come in again, going back to that idea of safety. That, that you were able, you know, feel like you fit in, it, it's a space for you and you're comfortable there. Oh, that's, that's great. And I think, Abby, I mean, you know, one of the things that even predated the pandemic is that you create a lot of, uh, you know, sort of home feeling spaces. Yeah. So yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I mean, a lot of what we, you know, 
the beginning of WeWork was, you know, the office is sort of stiff and rigid and we use, you know, we have music, we have soft seating. It's really more of a home environment. That's, that's an ethos that we, we carry. And we want to make sure people can do their work, but they can also have impromptu collaboration sessions out in the lounge that they don't necessarily need to go into a formal conference room that you can, and it can also hang out there. I mean, I think extending the hours of the day and letting your space serve you in different ways, whether we have a yoga event in the morning or we potentially have kind of a happy hour or a, a networking event in the evening just gives you that, that kind of freedom. Yeah, no, I love it. And our students have loved that. And I should say to the audience, that um, the the you know we work afforded our students twenty four seven uh, access, um, which was really important, especially for our East Asian students um, who make up a considerable um, uh, sort of a proportion of our international students. And with time zone differences, um, I would get an email from a student in Shanghai who would say. Uh, I'm at WeWork and it's 2 a.m. in the morning, um, her time. Um, and I think, you know, Abby, just before we, we, we move on, um, one of the things that happened with the pandemic is that the lines between home and office became blurry, right? Yes. And so uh, what you're offering is an opportunity for me um, to be at work, but still be in a home environment but be outside of my home so that, you know, at least when I'm at my home, I'm not working all the time. Yeah, no, it's interesting because I was on a, I, I, I moderated a, a health and wellness panel that at, at the WeWork Summit. And, you know, it's interesting. There were, you know, a couple of the people on the panel are saying, you know, people actually get around the block and come back to their home just so they can feel this delineation from work. And I think what we're trying to offer is we have locations everywhere. So maybe you're not going in, you know, for me, I'm, I live in Brooklyn. I don't need to go into Manhattan. I can actually use our locations in, in Brooklyn and get a smaller space. So I, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not complicating my, my, my um, commute to work. I, I don't have to deal with all the stresses. I could make it home in 15 minutes, you know, but I can still sort of separate. Cause I do think this, blur of, of, of work life. I mean, it, it's, it's one of the biggest problems I think we all experienced at the very beginning of just seeing how much one could work during the day. And, you know, I think being able to physically separate yourself um, is, is huge. That's terrific. That's terrific. I think, uh, you know, what's, what's your, you know, your vision, the vision of WeWork may have been uh, prescient for the time that we're coming into. So sort of you return, you retain some of the best uh, that you got during the pandemic, but you also shed some of the worst um, yeah. blurring of the lines. Thank you, uh, Abby. Cindy, I want to come back to you, and I want to come back on the issue of equity. Oh. equity. Um, okay, it's better now, I think. Okay. Um, and the question of how do we ensure that the new work world uh, is fair, just, and equitable for everybody. But I want to focus here on women, right? And the particular impact of the pandemic um, on women in the, work, in the workforce. I mean, we all know that women have disproportionately borne the burden of unemployment, and many um, are overwhelmed and have been overwhelmed by the need to care for dependent relatives and children and taking care of the home and the office while working from home. Uh, was this impact on women in the workforce a blip, you think, or does it set back the march toward gender equality in the workplace, or maybe does it accelerate um, the, 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 march, um, the march forward? So if you can take all of that, Cindy, and unpack it, <laughs> it would be terrific. <laughs> I, will, I will start off to say it all depends, because what I think we're in is a knowing, a saying, and a doing gap. We've heard from everyone here, all the experts here, what we know, what the research is showing us. And then in corporations, this is what we'll say that we'll, we, we are going to do for women. Here are our benefits. But then what we actually do, there may be gaps in between all of those things. I think when you look at women, we can't look at women as a monolith and we have to look at the intersectionality. Um, 
while, you know, as Juana talked about the impact uh, on senior women, there are degrees, there, there are levels of uh, leadership management within an organization. And so how someone would navigate at entry level versus to the point that you want to made and someone at senior at a senior level and the resources available it has disparities and so i think what we'll what we're finding is um it's going to come down to the organizations that really put their money where their mouth is and really walk the talk and so if we say as ebby talked about if we say that we are creating these inclusive environments um, where people get the access to what they need, I think what's required now is to understand the intersectionality and the generational differences that women have. And the needs are different when you are maybe 23, 33, 43, 53, and 63. And so a one size fits all approach to trying to support women in the workplace is not going to work. Um, but what I, what I will say in terms of it all depends is this ability to have truly more choice and control over your work life can be in theory a good thing, mm. but it's how it's going to be executed. Because if I say, we are a hybrid workplace, um, you know, as Christiane talked about, come here and find purpose in your work, but it's not really true, then women are always going to be questioning, should I be at home, should I be at work, or should I be somewhere else that requires more of my energy and time? So I think what's important is work has to matter. And the things that women are working on, they have to care about. And the organization has to care about it as well. So this um, integration of values is going to become extremely important. The workplace culture cannot continue to operate off of unwritten rules. If we say this is the environment that's going to work for everyone, it has to be that environment. Um, and so what I find that we're going to have to really get ready for is I do think women are going to leave or have already left. Mm -hmm. I don't, I think that's inevitable, but my thing is how do we get them back? Mm -hmm. And can we start thinking now innovatively of ways to onboard women back? There's just times in your life, you're not going to be able to do everything at the same time. But wouldn't it be great to know that you were part of an organization that thought of you, kept in touch with you, helped you continue to stay on top of your skills, and then helped you navigate back into the workplace, whether it's back to that employer or a future employer. So I think that's what's going to become extremely important, especially for women of color who have been disproportionately um, impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of loss in terms of trying to navigate, you know, as we've talked about this 24 hour culture, not that other people didn't, but if you're navigating COVID because people in your family and your community are being um, impacted and you are dealing with death and loss, it's very different in how you show up at work every day than someone who their COVID situation is just really a case of now I'm at home, I'm not in the office. Yeah. So I think really understanding all of those differences, and I think Yuana talked about this. This is what we're measurement and really getting feedback from employees is going to be important. We can't assume what they want. We, we have to ask, what do you need? And we have to be willing to make adjustments. So I know that was a, a, a lot to unpack. Um, but it does come down to it all depends on where you work. And that's what's going to be quite interesting. The yeah. disparities of what organizations will be able to do in terms of meeting the needs of women. But you know, as I'm listening to you, Cindy, I just want to make this observation. As I'm listening to you, I'm further convinced, not that I ever needed to be further convinced, that uh -huh. this is why we need more women leaders. Uh, yes. 
because of that, uh, you know, ability to sort of, you know, go out, ask employees what is it that they want, be sensitive to all of these issues, uh, but requires, um, I think, uh, you know, more women in leadership positions and hopefully more women of color in leadership positions um, who can also be sensitive to the uh, specific issues and challenges uh, that are more daunting, I think, for um, uh, for black and, and and brown women. So you know what? Um, just to, to add to that, I think the time is now that the you know the call to action on more diversity in leadership is going to get louder and louder. But you just talked about the business case for why it is important um, for us to have more diversity of thought, diversity of backgrounds, attributes, and experiences, because we are coming up against very challenging times that will require a different type of leadership. And we cannot do things the way that we've always done them. And so I think as organizations open themselves up to more diversity, and that means you need diversity in the pipeline, right? Because leaders don't just pop up, they're developed. And so yeah. we have to develop those leaders early at every level. Um, it's an exciting time and it's a, it's actually a little, you know, it's like daunting on how are we going to, to handle all of this. But I think when we unlock, as Ebby talked about, the ability to have more collaboration and innovation, um, the work that Christian is doing. Let's get people involved in solving the adaptive challenges of our time. And I think that's where we're going to start to see um, yeah. movement. Yeah. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Iwana, I want to come back to you and talk about, you know, the future in terms of standards, right? It's something that you look at and you study. And, you know, when you think about it, each era of work, at least over the past couple of centuries, has brought with it new normal standards of what is acceptable, right? Establishment of weekends, to child labor laws, to accommodations for disability, to what Cindy has been talking about um, in terms of inclusion and in terms of equity. Um, and those become standards, right? Um, not just nice things to have and good things to talk about. And uh, can you talk to us about what you see as new standards that are on the horizon? You know, what new trends uh, might you be seeing uh, uh, as emerging? I think one, uh, you know, a new standard um, that is emerging, you know, very strongly, and uh, all of the previous uh, speakers have talked about it, is flexible working and hybrid working. But let's not forget that this wouldn't be possible uh, without um, uh, uh, trends, underlying trends such as digitalization, uh, in increasing uh, use of um, data analytics, big data, virtual work. So this already pervades all the, the work aspects. And while um, I see that flexibility is in high demand, we have to make sure, I think, that flexibility uh, does not only serve the needs of the employers. Uh, I have seen this to be the case in the past when flexibility initiatives uh, were hijacked and ended up making uh, employees uh, available all the time. Uh, um, I've seen um, how um, Im Im implicit expectations from an employer that uh, the employee is always contactable can trigger feelings uh, of anxiety. And I've also seen how the impact of the always on culture can often um, go unaccounted for these guys as a benefit, you know, increased convenience, increased autonomy um, and uh, control over work life boundaries. But uh, with the, the reverse of the coin um, being that uh, these flexible work boundaries can or, and do in fact often turn into work without boundaries, compromising um, an employee's um, uh, health and uh, also their um, having a negative impact on, over um, their family life. So we, uh, in my research, I often talk about this as, uh, you know, um, an autonomy paradox. So yeah. you increase people's autonomy, 
Uh, so they have increased autonomy. They work from home. They uh, theoretically they can work uh, well whenever they choose. Uh, uh, but this, in the end, ends up uh, decreasing their autonomy because, in fact, they uh, end up working all the time. Uh, and so there is um, uh, a lot less um, respite, I guess. And, and re so related to, uh, to this trend, uh, which we've seen uh, more flexibility, increased autonomy, um, I've seen during this last uh, year uh, of conduct conducting interviews, what is emerging is um, a closer, I think, management of employees. Um, and, and this happens, you know, through different means, uh, more frequent uh, meetings, uh, more frequent um, evaluations, um, and also uh, an increased, I think, uh, transparency of, uh, and an increased scrutiny of people's uh, actions and behavior. Uh, because uh, now, uh, as uh, many things uh, happen through the mediation of, of technology, uh, what uh, all these uh, uh, work activities leave a digital trace, right? Uh, meetings can be recorded, the managers uh, can see if uh, the employees are online, offline, and how much of the time uh, they are online. Um, how many times they consult or access uh, different uh, different documents? So 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 all these um, uh, can um, can uh, things to look forward to can have negative consequences. Yes. Yeah. So so it is important. I think we are at uh, at some kind of crossroads where things can, as, as Cindy was, I think, saying one of the arguments that she was making, things can. Uh, you know, improve, but we uh, things can also go a, a lot worse. And you know, this is one of my fears that uh, uh, that good positive initiatives uh, can be hijacked and can serve uh, uh, finally the interest of the of the organization and not the that of the of the, um, of the employees. Which is which is sad because um, ultimately. It does hurt the organization, um, but oftentimes organizations don't necessarily look at it that way. I do, yeah, sorry, I, I, I do want to turn it to, to Shannon and to the questions, but um, I'll be remiss if I didn't ask um, just, you know, very quick questions to uh, uh, both. The, so, Abby, um, let's talk about the global, right? I mean, so. I think we work has sites in in almost a hundred cities around the world. So you have a global perspective on this. And one of the things that one thinks about when one thinks of the nature of work and homework balance is that historically the United States has taken pride in being the no vacation nation, right? While France, where Iwana and Christian currently are, sometimes I tease my French colleagues and friends and say, how do you have such a strong economy in good times uh, when you don't work nearly as much as, as, as we do, uh, which is unfair. I mean, and I say that only teasingly. Uh, France mandates 30 days of paid vacation. August is shut down in France. Um, and that's true also in other countries. Um, why is the U.S. like that? And do you see that changing? And while still thinking about the global, we've seen what seems sometimes a uniquely American problem um, of mental health issues related to work and overwork uh, for working you know, very long and very hard. Um, you know, it, it seems to be greater than it is in other countries. Is that true? I mean, do you have any comments on that? Do you think that that's related to um, how um, labor regulations perhaps are in some European countries, just for example, compared to the United States? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I've actually uh, lived in Tokyo and in Shanghai, so and also in Sydney, so I have a bit of a perspective on, uh, you know, how those countries behaved. I mean, I, I certainly think that, um, you know, in a place like Japan, where things are quite regulated, and they really want to ensure that they impre like protect their employees, I wouldn't say the US has as those same sort of regulations. 
Um, I mean, I do think what's interesting when we think about just companies having these like global footprints is that it starts to connect us a little bit more and those conversations start to happen about, um, you know, what we're doing around the world and, and even just sort of having observing as COVID kind of tidal waved over the entire world and how everybody was responding to it. You know, you start to sort of bubble up a lot of conversations about countries that you might not have had before. So I think it's interesting to think about when a company is tackling how they strategically manage a, a global footprint and their employees in each of those locations, now they sort of have to address the benefits and, and, and think about why a certain country would be different from the US if we're still humans, we still have the same needs. And, you know, I, I think, um, you know, that that starts to become a, a conversation that will ultimately spur on change, you know, and I think I think that is really the benefit of, of having this sort of work conversation at, at a much higher level. Um, rather than just, hey, this is a US centric problem, because I think if we stay in that dialogue, we're never actually going to, to make progress because we're not really engaging with our partners around the world to really understand why they put those regulations in place. Why did they want to sort of enforce, uh, you know, enforce uh, vacation? But I certainly would say here, you know, just just this, you know, we were um, on this panel, I, I, I moderated an interesting point is the physical challenges of COVID are so easy to tackle. This sort of mental and, and, and sort of um, ongoing effects around mental health are, are sort of our next pandemic to, to manage. And I think um, with that, a lot of these conversations around downtime, how do we use technology to, to create space for ourselves, not just for work, um, is, is definitely going to come up more and more. Well said, well said. And I think um, the fact that we've become, you know, despite the wishes of, uh, <laughs> you know, at least the former president of this country and, and, and others who are polarized around the world, we are living in a very global uh, society. And so somebody like you who has worked and lived in other parts of the world, uh, uh, you know, as we have greater labor mobility, I think uh, there will be uh, more room I think for, for influence and change. Christian, I want to end with you and I'm going to ask you to answer me very quickly before I turn it over to Shannon. Let me ask you, you know, sort of your perspective also dealing with the youth. Um, you know, when you think back to the Gilded Age of the early 1900s, the early plutocrats, I mean, think John D. Rockefeller, took pride in not working after earning their fortunes. So you worked until you earned their fort your fortunes and then you retired. You see a lot of people on Wall Street who retire in their early 40s, uh, for example. Um, but today, you also see, depending on the sector and the industry, uh, the, the wealthiest amongst us work even more than others and longer hours and during greater stress. Why do you think that is? And do you think that is likely to change with the upcoming uh, generation. So I'm sorry to give you very little time, but but uh, we need to move on. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, in our COVID response program, uh, we also say like women have suffered a lot from the pandemic on the workplace, but they made 70% of our volunteers. So it's really interesting because they also solve problems more than, <laughs> than men's. And so it's really crazy to see like this, uh, that yeah, I want more women leaders too. I just wanted to say that. Uh, and from my experience, uh, I think it's really, uh, I can't talk like, uh, there's all these like uh, billionaires like Elon Musk and he tweets how much he works and all of that and it's great. But what I see is more like uh, uh, young people who make fortunes in the tech world, they make money so early that then uh, if they retire, they have nothing to do for most of their life. <laughs> and so what I what I see, but maybe I'm biased because they come to see us, is they look for more purpose and, and basically they make a fortune and now they want to make the world a better place. And so they want to spend their life doing it. And maybe the example of what uh, Bill and Melinda Gates did or like this kind of generation with the giving pledge is showing that you can become the richest man on earth, but then it doesn't make you necessarily fulfilled you need to do other things after so i see this more and uh, yeah that's good news too good <laughs> thank you christian thank you uh shannon over to you thank you to the students for being patient and uh, please take it 
Thanks, Ethlon. So we're excited to have some questions from our students, and then we'll also get to questions from the general global audience. Our first student question is from Noel Files, who's joining us today. Noel, if you can turn on your camera and introduce yourself and ask your question to the panel. Welcome. I am Noel Files. I am a junior at Columbia GS. Uh, I'm studying political science, and I am hailing from Texas right now. So um, I think that's all the data you wanted um, introduction there. Um, so my question, and in large part, you all have really tackled it, and it's been really great. I've been writing notes. Um, really has to do with the return to office and to school and things like that. Um, you know, keeping in mind that um, mental health has really seen um, a, a, an increase in um, people just suffering with emotional or, or mental um, issues. Um, one of the things I found uh, researched, like the WHO uh, organization found that there was an increase in domestic violence. So, um, and, and of course, disproportionately against women. Um, when we think about asking people to return to work, whether it's a hybrid or a fully in-person um, situation, just um, thinking about setting up structures or providing um, counsel or, or just sort of like a re like how do we provide a soft landing for people who have really suffered um, under the constraints of working from home, be it because they have children, they are trying to manage children that can no longer go to school or daycare, um, or they have a spouse that's um, abusive or whatever the case may be, and they're just trying to continue to stay a viable part of the workspace, um, but they're coming back in sort of shattered or ragged, so to speak. Um, what sort of net um, have we thought about providing for for people that how have we thought about that we need to be looking for evidence or signs of, of that kind of trauma. Um, but, and, and that's just, that's just one corner, obviously that's, that's women, that's specific domestic violence. And I know that there are um, certainly cases of a dom domestic violence against uh, men as well, but um, you know, and, and those that, that struggle with, um, that have struggled with being isolated you know, people who are single, who don't have other family members that they live with, you know, they've, the amount of time that they've spent just completely alone, um, it certainly will have had a negative toll on, on their mental and emotional health. Um, how are we um, addressing that? How are we looking for signs of that sort of uh, ragged re-entry to um, more, you know, social interaction? So that was kind of one of the bigger questions that, um, that we had, and I, I'm excited because our second question really had to do with, um, you know, what what are companies, what are organizations, what are institutions um, beginning to develop um, in order to or frameworks um, in order to create more inclusive spaces, to create more, um, you know, sort of that that home feeling, like where I I can go, you know, take my lunch and like go work out, and then you know, come back, or let's say I'm nursing an infant. I mean, and I'm speaking from a female perspective because I'm a woman. So, um, but just being able to be more malleable, more flexible in order to support a resilient return um, to labor, um, it, you know, post pandemic. So um, I was like very excited to hear from uh, Abby and um, Cindy at some of the, the ways that we're trying to um, to address those, particularly for women, um, but I think really for everyone and thinking about, you know, religious spaces and um, just, I like the idea of lounges, like creating collaborative spaces for people to, to sit and, and, and discuss um, more freely, more in a um, more natural, more organic way versus, oh, we only meet when we're meeting in this particular meeting room. <laughs> you know, I think it would, um, I think it would increase the amount of synergy, the, the amount of um, people at all different levels and from all different backgrounds coming together and discussing issues in the workplace. And I think it's going to prove to be a very valuable um, tool. So that's what I had. I wonder, because I saw that some of this was resonating with Cindy and Ebby, and uh, okay. if you want to get some thoughts on what was shared in the question. Yeah, I mean, I can 
you know, just thinking about the physical space, I mean, I think if, you know, part of it is as, as the employer to sort of release people from this, like this strain of, of, of having to come in to show kind of FaceTime, you know, but on the physical side, so much of it is when, you know, that you're not avoiding work, that you're actually coming in because the space is, is better serving your work, right? And, and if your work is better served at a remote location because you can do heads down work, you're reading through a contract, you know, I think then that starts to say, why don't we create this sort of diverse set of spaces? Uh, you know, you can distribute your portfolio based on the type of work that best suits that person and also give them flexibility around their hours. And I think that's something we've tried to do. I mean, we have an all access membership. We have different degrees of membership so that you can start to engage with, you know, we have a lot of space and, and, and we can make that space feel comfortable, cozy, you feel at home, it doesn't feel pretentious, but it has all the amenities you need. I think the other thing we're really keen on is it's a shared environment. You know, when you come in, you're, you're cleaning up after yourself, you know, you're, you're taking care of the space because this is your community, you belong there. And I think that also sort of reinforces this thing of like, we trust each other, we're here, we're safe, this is a good environment, we feel like we can, we're equals. Um, but I definitely think if we can start to pivot the idea of coming into a space that best serves the work that I'm doing, there'll be no question that people will always come in when they, when they need to do that work rather than this suspicion that people are avoiding work or are you know, not, not working, you know? Cindy, any other Cindy, thoughts you wanted to Yeah, just to add to that, um, on the question you had about domestic violence, um, abuse, I think, you know, one of the things that we might not have talked about as much is how the workplace serves as this embassy, if you will. Um, when you're here, there's a level of safety. Uh, maybe, the, you know, there are levels of trust that we're trying to build. And oftentimes, the amount of time we spend with our coworkers, they become extended parts of our family. But when people are dealing with mental health issues, there's a degree of covering um, because we are trying to present our best selves. So, you know, would I really tell you what's happening in my home life? And so this is where I think a collaboratory is going to take place with um, not just corporations, but mental health institutions, with cities, provinces, um, to say, how do we come together and deal with this mental health crisis? One of the things that corporates are doing is really expanding the offerings of what we call an EAP, an Employee Assistance Program, with a focus on well being. And within that, making sure that we are culturally competent. Because the way that we would deal with people across the dimensions of diversity around mental health is going to be different. There are some communities, it is taboo. I am not going to tell you that I am not handling things very well. I might not even have the tools to understand that I'm in a state of stress brought on by trauma. So I think the other opportunity as we create these, these wonderful spaces where people can connect. And again, let me just say, we're transitioning into that because we're coming we're still in a pandemic and we're operating with masks and who's vaccinated and not vaccinated. So the level of trust and safety is not 100% yet, but I'll operate, let's say everything is better. Um, creating spaces where people can have conversation with their peers really around how they are doing. Not just the work product, not just let's solve this issue together, but how are you doing? And to what Evie does uh, with WeWork, uh, creating these um, opportunities for people to do yoga together, to talk about meditation, to introduce people to mindfulness techniques. That is what I'm seeing going to be on the rise. And I think back to leadership, what we talked about earlier, leaders that check in with their employees, their direct reports, around their mental health. And so this walking the talk, being a mindful leader is going to be being a purpose-driven leader. That's going to make the difference between, can I tell you what's really happening in my life? 
um, and how do I navigate that? So I hope that that answered your question. Um, I do think that EAPs are doing a good job on offering benefits that deal with um, a variety of issues that people face in the home front. So more to come on that. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. And thanks to you, Noel. So our next question is a video recorded question from Omar in Kuwait. And so let me pull the question up here. Here we go. Hello, my name is Omar Kamriye. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm currently a rising sophomore at Columbia College. And I was wondering, as a sustainable development and economics major, how is the COVID-19 pandemic going to affect the nine to five job format in the future? Thank you. So thanks Omar for that question. Iona, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that uh, with regard to this change in the nine to five format. Uh, I, well, I would say uh, uh, speaking for my, uh, uh, again, from the point of view of uh, knowledge workers, which I've been studying, I think this format was already something that was obsolete. Uh, um, uh, you know, a long time that it came obsolete a long time ago, and um, and I and I think you know going forward, uh, we are obviously as we discussed until now heading towards uh, uh, a lot more flexibility in terms of time, in term in terms of also of, of space, and um, and uh, this is all enabled by by technology. And so I think one important uh, challenge um, going forward is how do we uh, regulate uh, the use of technology? Because the problem, as Cindy was saying, is not with the technology itself, but the way it is, uh, it is used. And, and uh, moreover, uh, related to the, the, the question um, of nine to five hours, most of the people I interviewed were telling me that this is absolutely not what they are looking for, a nine, nine to five job. Um, because nine to five jobs uh, is, uh, is the, they consider it to be the type of job which is not sufficiently uh, intellectually stimulating, not sufficiently um, um, giving uh, one um, sufficient uh, um, stimulation. So, so, so this is at all not something that uh, they they were looking for. And I think, if I if I may, I mean, from the interviews that I've conducted recently. The more younger generation, uh, they run, uh, um, a lot of them, they run away from this type of jobs, uh, nine to five jobs, which are, which are considered to be bureaucratic and, and, and boring. And they look for something, uh, a work that is meaningful, a work that uh, allows uh, uh, them to, uh, to, to feel um, intellectually fulfilled. And, and sometimes, and I mean, quite often um, nowadays, uh, this type of job intellectually stimulated, it is considered that it comes with very, um, with the long hours and uh, continuous uh, availability. But I think, you know, uh, the experience um, for from the last year, and, and, and the fact that uh, so many people um, uh, worked, uh, worked from home and managed to juggle uh, work and, uh, and family and other uh, responsibilities uh, should, uh, should, I think it should show uh, and it should make more uh, acceptable uh, that uh, work, I mean, intellectually stimulating work doesn't necessarily have to come uh, at the package with the uh, overwork and and extremely extremely long long hours 
and people um, uh, we we see you know that people uh, even those that are very passionate about their jobs they see the uh, the importance uh, of um, of leisure or having other activities outside um, outside work and all these enriches you as a person and that, thus you are able to come to work um, as a more uh, as a, a richer person with richer experiences and and that can only be positive for your for your cre creativity so 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 i think that and to go back to what i was saying also um earlier going forward um uh, uh, companies, but also the state, uh, in France at least, uh, should have some more saying in, uh, in regulating technology, uh, the use of technology outside uh, normal working hours. In France, uh, such a law exists uh, uh, since uh, 2017, and this law establishes workers' right to, to, to disconnect and companies with more than 50 employees have to establish um, hours when staff should not or send or answer emails and i think this is uh, an important it's important because it creates um, a premise for everybody uh, to show their engagement uh, their commitment in a limited uh, i think number of hours and this places people with additional non-work responsibilities on a more equal footage, uh, I, I think, uh, footing with the with the others. Thank you so much, and uh, thanks to Omar for recording that question. Now, our graduate assistant Priya will read some additional questions. Priya, please introduce yourself and share the additional questions we've received from the collaboratory students. Hi everyone, I'm Priya, one of the graduate student facilitators uh, here at Global Columbia Collaboratory, and I'll be asking two questions from our students who unfortunately could not attend this um, event live. So our first question is from um, Haila Amin. She's currently located in Beijing, and she is from Columbia General Studies class of 2024 with a major in economics. And her question is, um, as remote work is becoming a trend, more and more students will choose to do a part-time internship during school semesters. Do you think this will positively help undergrad students in terms of growth? How will this increasingly um, uh, co increasing competition shape the job market? If the students choose to focus on his or her studies, will there be a disadvantage? Anyone want to take that on? I would like to just make a comment around that. One of the things that actually happened with COVID-19 last year is companies wanted to keep their commitments to students who they had offered internships. But the question was, how do you have a meaningful internship in a remote way? Because it's usually you come on site, that, that's what you get. You get a chance to be in a corporate workspace, observe how people work, and um, we just decided because we didn't have all the answers, let's do it. And with partners, uh, and, and these are also global partners, jumped in and said, this is how we can create the experience. I think the good news is that can continue. However, I would say that the model can expand. I was just on a call last week and the discussion around apprenticeship and the importance of apprenticeship, which is different from an internship. So I think the ways that students can start to learn and build skills will evolve. And we can rethink this, um, an internship being this either paid or non-paid gig where you get the coffee, because we know that <laughs> some of the internships, you're like the glorified um, administrative assistant there and really look at how we can create experiences for students in a remote way where learning is happening and then um, augment those experiences with maybe things that are happening locally. So it's not always you have to go directly to that site. Maybe you can, um, we partner with WeWork and we find out ways that students can get involved in a different way. So I think for us to actually have 
the workforce of the future with the skills that we need, we have to rethink what our, um, our response and the way that we plan and deliver internships. Thank you. Priya, I know there's one more question. Thank you so much, Cindy. My next question is from Nicholas De Constanzo. He is a Columbia General Studies student from the class of 2023 with a major in visual arts. And his question is, do you think it is a good idea for institutions to continue using remote work and school systems developed during the pandemic after the pandemic is over? Why or why not? You want to take that on? Abby, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, um... I think we have to, you know, I think in order to really meet people where they are, I mean, I think we have to continue to support this part of the workplace as much as we need to be able to provide, um, you know, safe physical space um, and amenities that serve people because everyone's going to have a varying degree of comfort. Um, and, you know, I even you know, see people that report into me the, the varying needs and, and having challenge for so many employers is they don't actually have the toolkit to, res to respond to those. So if we're able to create that sort of the, that flexibility and get the technology there, get the platforms there, get the sort of, you know, in our case, a working co-working, you know, space and, and accessibility to spaces near their homes, you know, ultimately then it becomes just a conversation and, 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 and building that with each employee and, and, how, uh, and how to be as flexible and as, you know, compassionate as possible. Thank you. And just to quickly add to that, Shannon, I think um, one of the things that we didn't have a chance to talk about, but maybe we come back together um, or in some format and we can have a longer discussion on it. But this has also raised the disparities of access. So when we talk about accessibility, you know, we've heard a lot about the digital divide. And so when we're thinking about access to education, I think this is also something where corporations and institutions have to come together for cities and the environments that we, we're in to really be viable and that we have access to Wi-Fi and that um, we have access to the tools. You know, there were many students are missing, like they don't know what happened in terms of them not being able to plug in, maybe only not having access to a laptop. So I think this is an opportunity for us to say, we will not leave anyone behind. We will make sure that um, we are equipping our communities with what they need. And that gets back to our conversations on equity. So we have to continue with these hybrid models, but I think we also have the issues of accessibility must be addressed. And I think we have the resources to do it. It's just actually doing it. Thank you so much, Cindy, and, and thanks to Priya for sharing those questions. You know, we could go on and on for a number, another hour, and we've received questions from the global audience that many of which were answered during our discussion. I've in truly enjoyed this engaging discussion about one of the most pressing concerns in the world today, the future of work. We've talked about the impact of the pandemic to work-life balance collaboration and innovation, the implications for diversity, equity, and inclusion, the call for action for women and more diversity in leadership, and to reimagine our workspaces in the future in terms of standards and best practices. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the first seminar of the Summer Global Columbia Collaboratory, a virtual exchange platform that brings Columbia students and thought leaders and educators together. We're looking forward to our next collaboratory seminar, so please keep an eye out for the announcement. I want to remind Columbia Columbia undergrads uh, students joining us today that will also be collecting additional applications beginning for the fall cohort. And thanks again to the four esteemed panelists who joined us today, Cindy, Ebby, Iona, and Christian. Many thanks to the team at the Columbia Global Centers, Columbia World Projects, Columbia College, and the Center for Undergraduate Global Engagement. And of course, we want to extend a very special thank you to our amazing collaboratory students, partners, and participants from around the world. I wanna hand off to Safwan for some final remarks and a reminder to everyone that a link to the recording of the full webinar will be sent to everyone who registered and for others, you'll be able to find it on our website. So thank you and be well, Safwan. Thank you, Shannon, thank you. 
I mean, this has been amazing, really. Um, you each brought um, incredibly insightful and valuable perspectives. I mean, when one thinks about the future of work, uh, you know, work-life balance, I mean, some of those ideas, some of those themes might seem very obvious, but they're not. I mean, you know, they're so layered and they're so complex and there is such a, uh, a powerful dynamic among um, the various issues uh, that uh, come up when one talks about the future of work. Um, so I'm very, very grateful to the uh, four of you and really to the perspectives and experiences that you brought um, to bear on this discussion. The um, students, you know, uh, Noel and, and, and Priya for the questions that you brought from other students were really um, remarkable. And I apologize to our other audience members that we didn't get to their questions. Although as uh, Shannon has noted, many of those questions I think were inadvertently addressed uh, by, the, uh, by the panelists. Um, we could have another discussion on this, and I think we should have another discussion on this. I mean, just if you take the issue of equity and justice, I mean, um, in the workplace, that alone deserves um, its own uh, discussion, as do many of the themes that we discussed today. Um, so I feel enriched, and I think everybody here uh, does as well. And I think, uh, you know, believe that no good deed goes unpunished. So I hope uh, that all of you will uh, expect that we will call on you um, again and again uh, to participate in various programs. But uh, um, Cindy, I look forward to maybe meeting you on campus uh, when we're back. Maybe I'll even audit one of your classes. I have a lot to learn, and Abby. Uh, next time I'm at WeWork, um, we have to make a point of uh, getting together. You really um, are a source of um, intellectual heft, I think, you know, to the senior team at, uh, at WeWork. So thank you for that. And Iwana, everything I had heard from Severine and other uh, members of the staff of our Global Center in Paris, um, you know, I see uh, the power of your thoughts and the power of ideas uh, that you bring to the table. And Christian, uh, keep up uh, the great work, um, really, and connecting with younger uh, citizens of the world. And uh, we look forward to uh, great accomplishments uh, by you in the, in the years to come. Uh, you can tell I don't want to let go. I don't want to end this, uh, but I have to end it because we are over time. So just my deep appreciation to all of you and certainly to my partner, um, Shannon, and for all her staff in uh, undergraduate um, global education. Goodbye. Bye.